Thank you very much, Salim, and thank you all for the opportunity to share some of the experiences uh, from a fund's point of view um, on integrating community voices into adaptation finance. So my name is Daniel. I work with the Adaptation Fund Secretariat and report to the board, um, which is um, a board of majority developing country representatives. Um, what I plan to do in this presentation is to talk about three things. First of all, very briefly, I'm going to give an overview of uh, the climate finance landscape and where the Adaptation Fund fits into that. I'm then going to talk about uh, what the Adaptation Fund has done in recent years to mainstream the community voice into all of its decision-making processes. I'm finally going to talk about something called direct access, which is um, an innovative, groundbreaking mechanism to give the full power for climate finance to developing countries. And we believe this has real potential uh, to change uh, the way things happen in adaptation finance. So just very briefly, this is an overview of the, let's say, the landscape for adaptation finance, which has emerged over the past decade. Um, there are a number of funds there, uh, managed by a number of entities. So uh, the GEF, for example, um, administers the Least Developed Countries Fund, which predominantly deals with NAPAs. Uh, the Special Climate Change Fund, which deals with technology transfer and adaptation. And those have been around since the early 2000s. The World Bank administers the pilot program on climate resilience, and you'll see that one has uh, the largest pot of money so far. And there's, then there's the Adaptation Fund, which I will talk in uh, just a second about in terms of uh, how it gets its money and how it's governed. And then, of course, the Green Climate Fund, which is long awaited, uh, which may be fully operationalized within the next few years and may have some share of $100 billion, which the international community uh, is, has promised to mobilize. So the Adaptation Fund uh, is financed uh, predominantly through an international global levy on transactions on the clean development mechanism. So 2% of all of the shares uh, of carbon emission reductions go to the Adaptation Fund and go towards concrete adaptation projects in developing countries. And this was set up under the Kyoto Protocol. As I mentioned, uh, the people who I work for, which is the board, is governed by a majority of developing country parties. Uh, so we have uh, representation from the small island developing states, least developed countries, and all of the UN regions uh, in the world. Uh, and this is the only fund which, um, you know, uniquely all developing countries, which are parties to the Kyoto Protocol, uh, are eligible to access for project financing. This is a global overview of the portfolio of projects and programs. So the Adaptation Fund in the past few years, since 2010, has approved 28 concrete adaptation uh, projects and programs. And there's a link there at the bottom of the screen to our website. Uh, this is a screenshot actually from our recently launched interactive map. And if you look at the interactive map there, you can zoom in on each, any of those projects uh, and find out more information about them and to see exactly where adaptation finance is going down to the local level. OK, so that's an overview of the, of the fund. Uh, what I want to talk to you about now is what the fund has done in recent years to get the community voice into decision-making procedures. Because the fund recognizes that um, for, it has a mandate to deal with adaptation, to address adaptation needs at the local level uh, for the most vulnerable communities, uh, and therefore the, the most vulnerable communities have to be involved in that decision-making making process. So since the very beginning, uh, the fund has actually been accompanied on its journey by an independent network of NGOs uh, in developing countries and in developed countries uh, led by German Watch. So this independent network of uh, NGOs and civil society organizations um, provides a space whereby uh, the voice of local communities can emanate up through the structure, through the hierarchy, to the board level. And this is done through uh, country partners, which German Watch is in touch with. Um, I know BCAS is a member of this network and Practical Action uh, and, and many others which are specific to countries where uh, we implement projects. But the point here is that what this does is it takes voices from the local communities up to the board level where three or four times a year where the board meets, it actually engages in a formal dialogue with civil society. 
Now, this has caused significant improvements in the fund's procedures, and it has caused change. Uh, some examples um, are due to the pressure from NGOs and, and civil society. In the early days of the fund, um, they wanted to understand better how the, how the board was reaching decisions on what projects were being approved and what projects were not being approved. So to better understand the technical aspects of adaptation, what, we, what the fund did was to decide every single technical review, which we do ex ante, is now available online. So anybody in the world can see how the fund reaches its decisions with respect to why this project goes ahead or why this one needs a bit more work before it, before it can be considered a good, effective adaptation project that meets the most vulnerable. Another change that emanated up through this structure um, was the call from local communities and civil society to make gender a specific review criteria, which wasn't the case in the early days, but I'm glad to say that now it is. And now when we do a review in the Secretariat and with the board, uh, gender is something which we look at both in terms of ha has that been addressed in terms of design of the proposal? And do we have disaggregated results so that we can see uh, year on year and at the end of the project what was delivered um, for women's adaptation needs and what was delivered for, for men's adaptation needs? Okay, so just there are many review criteria, but I wanted to just highlight three which I think um, show the efforts that the fund goes to to fulfill its mandate to addressing the needs of the most vulnerable. So one is that proper genuine consultation is required with communities and project intended beneficiaries uh, as well as local government. And the idea there and what we check for is that um, real participation has drawn out local knowledge and local adaptation solutions and that communities have been involved in an appraisal to see how can we get a comprehensive adaptation project together which has sort of the top-down science where necessary and the bottom-up ideas of what works and what has worked in the past. Secondly, the project needs to articulate the benefits, so environmental, economic and social, to the most vulnerable communities. And that's not something, we don't prescribe how the entities should prove that, but we want to see a sort of logical uh, manner in which they've uh, addressed the needs of the most vulnerable. And then finally, as I mentioned, the gender considerations have to be addressed, uh, including actually the results which are delivered during and at the end of the project. Okay, this is a very simplified view of our project cycle, and it's a typical project cycle where the country does the appraisal of adaptation initiatives. Uh, the part in the, in the middle, which is a darker color, uh, is the part where the secretariat and the board does its review. Uh, and then, of course, we have the implementation and evaluation. But that bit there, the reason I've highlighted that is to show, as a fund, at the very high level of international climate finance, that's where we have our influence. And if we want to make sure that projects really meet the needs of the most vulnerable, that's where we make sure that the community voice comes in. So uh, coming up from the bottom there, we have civil society organizations commenting on every review now, uh, and we have uh, external NGOs and academics and so on. Um, everybody's uh, available, everybody's got the option to provide inputs into those reviews. And through the NGO network, all the way through this whole project cycle, uh, we continually have input, feedback, constructive criticism uh, from civil society. The challenge which we face at this present time is that although we put all of our uh, technical reviews online, what we would like to see during the process is a greater involvement of local communities. Um, so if, if we're sitting in our offices in Washington and we're uh, deciding or, or recommending whether a project goes ahead or not, um, there is a window where local entities and local communities uh, can access online the proposal and give their inputs and their feedback about uh, the merits or, or, or otherwise of the proposal. So um, something we've not been able to do so far is to really mobilize voices at that local level in the critique of the designed proposal, and that's something we'd like to work on. Finally, I want to speak to you about something called direct access. And direct access uh, is basically the idea of giving the full power to developing countries to manage the finances of the project and to do all the decision making within the country. Now, we think this gets around one of the main challenges of adaptation finance. Now, if you imagine you have $10 million to do a project, then you've got to balance it between doing concrete activities for the most vulnerable to address the urgent needs, and then also doing some sort of programmatic activities at the higher level to mainstream. 
Now, direct access puts into practice the, the principles of the Paris Declaration on aid effectiveness and it allows national entities to become on an equal footing in the funds view with the World Bank, the UNDP and so on. And we now have 15 national entities. The way this works uh, is very simple. A, a government or a country decides we want to nominate this entity, whether it's a trust fund, an NGO, a cooperative or a government entity, and they're the ones which if they meet the standards on financial management and transparency and so on, if they meet the right standards, they implement the, pro the adaptation projects for the full country. Now, I'm running a little bit short on time, so I'm just going to skip over the project that I was going to talk about. But one of the first projects which we have implemented, which was the first approved in 2010, was the Senegal project. And this was a project that dealt with coastal erosion. But what's happened there in terms of scaling up, and the project has been very successful, is that from the concrete activities at the project level, through a media and campaign strategy, they've got very good awareness at the national level. Um, at the global level, it's won uh, a UNFCCC Lighthouse Award, sponsored by Bill and Melinda Gates and possibly the Rockefeller Foundation as well. And so what this means now is you have global knowledge and global appreciation of this concrete project, one of many, which hopefully will scale out by causing more projects to be replicated. But the thing with direct access which is different is that you have a legacy. Long after the finance has left and the project is finished, you have strong national institutions which have proven that they can manage the finance of these, pro of these projects, they have the capacity uh, to, to do so, and that they have these links with uh, communities which they've always had and which they've strengthened. So we think that direct access has real potential to really involve communities uh, in, in that process. And just to reiterate that, this is one quote from one of the 15 in, uh, national entities. Fundi Cooperación from Costa Rica was motivated to become accredited through the fund because adaptation challenges go beyond the funds of the adaptation fund. Having strong in-country capacity on adaptation is seen as essential for replic replicability and sustainability of initiatives. And obviously what that means is $10 million, which the fund can provide to every country, is not going to address the adaptation needs of a full country. But through direct access, uh, the legacy is that you have strong institutions which can then mainstream and deal with adaptation in the long run. And that's, that's all from me right now. Uh, on, this, on the screen now are the challenges which I've faced, which I've uh, posed to you. So I'll leave them there for your consideration. And um, if, you, if you want to uh, ask any questions or uh, use those to have a discussion, pleased to do so. Thank you very much.